So, students, welcome back to developmental biology course. Um, in the last class, we were discussing about uh, the early uh, embryogenesis in plants. Specifically, we focused on um, the body plan uh, establishment, that is, the radial patterning that happens at the globular stage of the embryo, and then the epical basal axis establishment that gives rise to the shoot and root uh, um, in a primordium. So, today we continue from there and um, so I, I told you that from globular to the next stage that is heart shaped transition is uh, made obvious by the formation of the cotyledons. When the cotyledons start to, uh, you know, form, then the globular shape changes into heart shape because of these two protrusions. And by that stage, uh, I told you that the epical basal polarity becomes obvious. And um, one of the three, uh, you know, purposes of uh, embryonic development, that is, um, you know, setting up the epical meristems, that is, this is the shoot epical meristem and then this is the root epical meristem. So, these two become quite obvious by the time of heart shape. So, now we will go to the meristem establishment in a minute, but before that let us uh, consider cotyledons briefly. So, these are the early uh, leaf like structures that form uh, when the seed is going to germinate and these are involved in uh, a very initial photosynthesis and thereby establishes the new food production uh, when uh, it is going to germinate. And in addition to initiating photosynthesis, it also cotyledons uh, store food, uh, you know, carbohydrate, lipids and uh, proteins and therefore, they provide additional nourishment, addition to uh, what is provided by endosperm. Um, and in some of the plants, these cotyledons also uh, facilitate the food reserve transfer from the um, endosperm to the embryo. So, that is about the cotyledons. And the cotyledons form not from any one specific layer, it is from the embryonic tissue in general. So, the next uh, we are going to look at are the meristem establishment. So, meristems are nothing but a uh, cluster of undifferentiated cells equivalent to what we call stem cells in animals. And uh, these are uh, clusters that are there on the uh, top that is the uh, in the epical basal polarity on the epical side and that is the shoot mer epical meristem and then this is the root meristem. So, these two are produced um, more or less independent of each other, okay. Um, and the entire sporophyte body uh, is derived from them. For example, uh, the branches, uh, leaves and finally, the reproductive organs, inflorescence, flowers all come from the shoot apical meristem. And similarly, the root uh, cap and the root tissues, they all come from the root meristem. So, the entire sporophyte body are derived from these two meristems that are set apart during the embryogenesis. And uh, genetic uh, mutants isolated in Arabidopsis uh, indicate or provide evidence that these two uh, apical meristems form independent of each other. For example, there are mutants um, uh, like uh, shoot meristemless gene, uh, you know, mutant alleles of this gene, or uh, they do not produce the shoot uh, meristem, but in them the root meristem formation is unaffected. So, similarly, in hobbit, the opposite happens, like the shoot meristem forms properly, but the root meristem does not form. And in topless mutants, you have the shoot apical meristem like cells instead of forming uh, root tissues, okay. So, these are the mutants that uh, provide, uh, uh, you know, a handle for us to get to the genetic control and therefore, understanding the molecules involved in these body uh, 
early body patterning in the plants. So, these are still emerging and then a uh, very active area of research. Okay. So, once the body patterning is established, like right now we are in, you know, if you want to draw parallel with the Drosophila, it is like segmentation of the embryo is done. So, right after that there what will happen, it will go into forming the other tissues and organs and like that it will move on in the development. But that does not happen in plants, instead the, the plant development takes a break at this step. Once the body planning is established, that is the radial and axial patterning is established, the next thing what it does is it starts to produce food reserve. Okay. So, in the last class I mentioned that so here the embryo needs to move from the parent, the sporophyte to other locations where the, you know, the, they can have conducive environment and food reserve to grow up. So, the di seed dispersal um, is an essential part of uh, how plants reproduce and um, you know uh, develop. And that uh, necessitates a requirement of a break at this step in the development and instead uh, genes involved in making st um, storage uh, reserves, they get activated. For example, seed storage proteins are abundantly expressed and um, then the food accumulation starts. Instead of continuing with the plant development, embryonic development, now uh, the focus is on expressing the food reserve related genetic activity and uh, it accumulates lot of food. Once uh, that is done, then uh, it takes another break. Okay. So, that break is what we call as dormancy. Okay. So, the metabolism slows down, connection with the ovary is now cut, like they, the, pl the placental connection is cut and the integuments um, start to harden and become seed coat. And the embryo proper, the endosperm or the seed loses lot of water, okay? it desiccates. Um, basically, everything becomes very compact, packed food reserve and then the embryo alone and all are protected by the seed coat, which is basically integument that hardens into seed coat. And obviously, all of these process, you know, quite... Uh, uh, complicated and have to happen in a certain order and therefore, it is all very well uh, and precisely controlled by a genetic pathway which is still being elucidated. Okay. And uh, an important point to note here is the plant hormones uh, control these genetic pathways that regulate dormancy. Okay. So, uh, for example, abscisic acid is a predominant plant hormone involved in dormancy, uh, like entry into and maintaining dormancy and gibberellins do the opposite. So, these promote breaking dormancy, which we will, uh, you know, discuss in the next slide. But suppose if you have a problem in this genetic pathway, for example, the viviparous uh, mutants of maize. So, what happens is instead of these seeds, the kernels, staying in the ear um, in dormant stage, they continue to the next step and they start germinating. Okay. So, that is not going to be uh, a successful reproductive strategy, it is not going to have access to you know the minerals and other nutrients from the ground and taking up water and establishing as an independent individual plant is not going to be possible if this happens. So, that is why the entry into dormancy and then subsequent seed dispersal is very critical and uh, genetic. Uh, so, therefore, there is a lot of interest in understanding how the dormancy is regulated. Okay. So, next we will look at, okay, so once dormancy is induced, when do they actually come out of dormancy and then continue the development? So, that process we call as environment, uh, sorry, germination. And germination, as you can imagine, uh, should happen at the right time and the right environment. The you know the it, it like 
plants cannot, uh, the, the seed cannot germinate and make a successful, uh, you know, plant uh, by germinating in the middle of deep winter, uh, if it is, uh, you know, in, in temperate uh, geographical area where it is frozen for during the winter period. So, it, it will be unsuccessful and the seedling that germinates will die. So, therefore, the environmental factors such as temperature, um, water and light, you know, is there sufficient light and is there water availability and is there enough oxygen, all of them are central to determining germination, okay. So, for, for example, um, the long day, short day uh, pattern matters uh, with respect to light and temperature um, and so on. So, so again therefore, uh, the environmental cues are sensed quite efficiently by the dormant seed and only under the appropriate environmental condition it is going to start the germination. Um, here are some of the examples of such uh, factors. One is stratification or you know like uh, another word for similar thing is vernalization uh, at a different um, uh, stage of development we use the word vernalization but here for the germination we use the word stratification which is nothing but having experienced uh, the winter that is the seed needs to necessarily be at a colder temperature for a certain period of time to be able to germinate. That sort of indicates that the seed experienced winter, now the winter is over and the spring is coming. So, therefore, it is appropriate time to initiate uh, germination. Okay, so, the experiencing of the cold temperature is a prerequisite in, the, in those uh, species for germination and that we call as stratification. Okay. So, in some situations where the plant has to experience similar cold temperature before in the inducing flower formation, there we call vernalization. Okay. And second, uh, there should be enough water um, so that the, remember in dormancy the seed lost lot of water, it desiccated. Now, for the embryo to grow up, it has to take up water and that process we call as imbibition. And imbibition is uh, facilitated by the, uh, you know, the embryonic root called the radical. So, once the radical forms, it helps in taking up water and it, the embryo gets rehydrated and then it is ready to activate metabolism and to move on with the development. And in some cases where the seed dispersal is really key, the, the seeds really need to experience um, uh, really harsh conditions. For example, uh, some of the seeds ne really need to be the, the thick outer coat needs to be injured ra rather scratched um, and that process is called the scarification. Uh, for, for example, when the seed is eaten by uh, a fruit eating uh, organism like frugivore, and in its gut, it experiences acidic conditions and that helps in the scarification and that is a prerequisite for germination. So, that sort of a thing like uh, having gone through the gut uh, indicates that it has been dispersed as well. So, so the frugivores in that way help in dispersal as well as uh, scarification to initiate germination. So, like this, uh, the, the main emphasis here um, is all the environmental cues are really crucial in determining the germination, okay. So, the next what we are going to do is, okay, fine. So, the after the initial body patterning, it uh, started accumulating food, then it slowed metabolism, desiccated, cut the contact with the um, sporophyte and then desiccated and became dormant. Then under appropriate conditions, it is germinating. So, now we will get back to the development and see um, how the initial development happens. So, uh, given that this is an introductory developmental biology course, we are not going to look at all aspects of plant development. So, we are going to choose uh, you know, a, 
some processes that are very well understood genetically and we are going to focus only on that. So, primarily we are going to focus on uh, flower development. Okay. So, before going into that, I um, will briefly introduce the the you know the, the structure of a typical angiosperm that is a typical flowering plant the sporophyte stay you know uh, generation of a uh, angiosperm so shown in this uh, cartoon is one such flowering plant with the flowers there so you have the root and then below the cartel we call the hypocartel then you have the cartilidens then cartilidens to the first leaf we call the epicartel then you have the leaves then you have the axillary bud that is formed uh, between the stem and the leaf at that angle and then you have the internode then you have finally flowers ok. So, flowers can be axillary or terminal flower and a stem like structure having only flowers we call that as inflorescence ok. So, this is morphology of a generalized angiosperm um, sporophyte. So, now let us um, get to development. Um, so, the, the first thing uh, is uh, we are going to focus again on the two meristems. So, what do they do? What kind of structures they uh, make up? And then we are going to quickly jump into uh, flower development. Okay. So, the rest of leaf development, stem development, vegetative growth, um, all of that we are going to kind of pass through. So, so this is a, a root and this is the root uh, epical uh, in, uh, meristem area and these are the cluster of uh, meristematic cells. They give rise to this root cap. So, this is uh, these cells lubricate and help in penetrating into the soil uh, when these upper regions uh, elongate and divide and when, when they push this um, epical meristem down. And these as they are uh, shearing against the soil, these are going to be lost anyway and they are going to be newly made again and again by these meristems that will differentiate. So, these meristems, meristematic cells are like animal stem cells in the sense that they divide, produce one daughter cell that is a differentiating cell for example, making root cap, another one is a meristem itself. So, that is how the mitotically dividing undifferentiated population of cells are maintained here. So, in addition to the root cap, the root uh, epical meristem uh, cells give rise to the other three layers of the root as well. Like remember uh, I told in the last class protoderm, the dermal tissue, then the ground tissue from which pith and other cortex etcetera are formed and then the procambium from which the vascular tissues are going to form. So, in addition the growing root uh, produces lateral roots and therefore, there, there are lateral uh, meristems set up also. They come from, they originate from the innermost part or uh, that is what we call as pericycle. So, this is from the cambium. So, so these cells give rise to the lateral mer root meristems and that is how the root um, branches form. Okay. So, now let us look at the shoot apical meristem. Shoot apical meristem um, again similarly uh, is required for generating all the uh, you know um, uh, shoot uh, organs like leaves, stem, branches and eventually uh, producing inflorescence and flowers all of that come from this. And in addition uh, and, uh, the shoot apical meristem also gives rise to the axillary meristem and the axillary meristem unlike the uh, root lateral meristem which comes from the innermost layer, this comes from the surface layer of cells. So, they give rise to the axillary meristem and um, so, the that is essential for branching as well as the leaf primordium to start like for example, here you have a leaf primordium uh, developing and here another one coming out. And in, in turn it makes the, uh, the same three layers of cells as well. And the root in the apical meristem, the shoot apical meristem, uh, the genetic studies as well as the chimera experiment that is transplanting uh, part of layer of um, meristematic cells 
of one genotype to another genotype and observing uh, what structures it contributes to. So, that is what is chimeric experiment like you are taking analogous tissue from one genotype and then you are grafting on to a similar location on another uh, uh, any plant that is of a different genotype. So, those uh, experiments uh, helped people identify uh, three main layers of the apical meristems here labeled as L1, L2, L3 and these layers give rise to different structures. So, that is what people have understood by doing those kind of experiments. For example, here in this um, uh, figure on the right side, you see some uh, variegated leaves while then other leaves are uh, properly uh, normal, fully green. And that is because um, in the initial uh, you know, uh, apical meristem of uh, this plant, one side of it where the L2 layer has been uh, transplanted from a genotype that is defective in producing chlorophyll. So, therefore, the L2 in this particular uh, uh, case does not produce uh, chlorophyll and L2 is the layer from which the edges of the leaves form. So, as a result here the uh, edges look uh, white and the L1 normally does not um, you know produce uh, chlorophyll and the L3 does not contribute to the edges and that is why um, the middle region uh, coming from L3 has the chlorophyll. Okay. So, this is how the contributions of the different layers have been understood. Okay. So, now what we are going to look at is how these um, meristematic cell populations are controlled. So, so this is a very uh, important aspect of any stem cell system, uh, particularly adult stem cell systems, where maintaining a balance between the number of cells that are in the undifferentiated um, state that is um, stem cell fate versus the number of cells that are differentiating need to be balanced. If you do not balance this, then you will have two, uh, like suppose if the self renewal if that is prominent then the organs will not have proper contribution of differentiated cells and they will not form properly the right proportions will not be there. And in an extreme case if there is no differentiation then you will only have a mitotically proliferating tumor like lump of cells and no tissues will be formed. And if, if there are no stem cells maintained, the other extreme like everything all cells differentiate, then there will be no more stem cells to give rise to uh, further development like no new organs or new kinds of tissues can be formed. So, therefore, there is this um, uh, the size of the stem cell population needs to be tightly controlled. And that has been understood to some extent through genetic studies in Arabidopsis um, and uh, that is what is cartooned here. So, essentially the gene Wu shell um, promotes the, the cells that produce Wu shell uh, promote stem cell fate on the layer above it and that makes them remain as stem cells. And but Wuschel activity is not uncontrolled, it is controlled by a group of genes called Clavata genes. So, the, for the spelling you can see the heading here, Clavata genes. So, the Clavata genes antagonize Wuschel. So, Clavata genes are 2 and 3 together form a receptor, a serine therionine kinase um, enzyme and a receptor that is what those two encode and they receive the Clavata 3 signal. Okay. So, this is like a ligand produced by the cells that are actually in proliferative uh, fate and they suppress Wuschel. So, it is kind of a feedback, negative feedback and that ensures that this population is um, uh, you know at the normal level. So, it, it restricts the size of this. So, if you do not have Clavata, then Wuschel will not be negatively regulated and the stem cell population will enlarge 
and as a result you produce uh, more number of organs which we will see in the next slide which is a clavata mutant. Um, so that is what will happen. And in addition to this clavata and Wuschel uh, regulation, so you have another uh, a gene called STM which inhibits differentiation and in, uh, in addition it also promotes the Wuschel expression. So, so this again helps in making sure that these three genes put together uh, make sure the population of meristem is maintained at a normal level. So, this is how the uh, self-renewal population and the cells that are differentiating uh, is balanced. Okay, so, here you have um, three photographs showing um, you know what happens uh, when you have clavata mutant mutation. So, this is the wild type where you have normal number of flower buds forming and these are the flowers that are coming up. And this is uh, clavata 3 to uh, uh, mutant, we are looking at the meristem and the inflorescence meristem and then you can see there are large number of uh, flowers forming, okay. But it is due to bigger uh, size of the inflorescence meristem. So, as a result it is giving rise to more floral meristems and therefore more flowers are forming. And here we are looking at a defect in floral meristem itself. We will learn in detail about inflorescence meristem, floral meristem etc. Uh, uh, in another few minutes. Uh, here we are looking at another meristem defect. So, here we saw inflorescence meristem what happens if it is big? If it is big, it gives rise to many uh, more floral meristems and as a result you get many more flowers. And in the floral meristem when you have, um, it's when its size is big due to clavata uh, 3 to mutation, then you have more floral organs produced. Inflorescence meristem defect, uh, bigger meaning more flowers. And when you have bigger floral meristem meaning more floral organs like for example, you see here it has 6 petals uh, while normally it is only 5. And similarly, if you look at the you know the stamen you have again uh, a lot more numbers and again if you look at carpal there again they are more than adult okay. So, they should have been 5 each and instead they are all more of that. So, this uh, sort of will highlights the importance of regulating the self renewal differentiating population to make uh, an optimum um, body plan uh, that is optimum for generating reproductive structures and seeds and so on. Okay, so, this is about the you know regulation of the shoot apical meristem. And we also discussed the root apical meristem. In addition, there are other meristems, two other meristems as well. We will briefly understand what they are and then we will move to the flower. So, so if you take a cross section of the shoot, um, the stem portion and if you look at it. So, you have these red, the two red layers of cells. So, these are lateral meristems, okay. So, these give rise to cells that help in broadening like growing in a broader way like the thickness of the um, uh, stem in increases or the girth of the stem you know uh, radial expansion of the stem increases. And that radial expansion of the stem is contributed by the cells arising from these two meristems okay the cork meristem the that is the cork cambium that is the outer uh, one and then you have the vascular cambium that is inside and these two meristematic cells are called the lateral meristems and they help in the um, you know the uh, increase in the width of the stem. So, that is um, um, you know another uh, set of uh, meristems that um, work in the plants and contribute to growth. And this is primarily in the dicots and monocots have uh, additional meristem uh, distributed differently and contributing in a different manner. 
So instead of having a continuous inner layers, uh, lateral meristems, so they are uh, present or uh, disposed within the adult cells and these are called the intercalary meristem. So this is like the node and just next to the node you have these intercalary meristems disposed among the uh, adult uh, cells like differentiated cells. And these meristems uh, divide and they elongate uh, giving rise to the uh, plant growing you know in the apical basal direction that is the, the shoot grows top to the top okay. It, uh, the plant becomes taller due to that sort of a um, intercalary meristem driven um, growth okay. So this is quite common among the monocots. So we have learnt about shoot me apical meristem, root apical meristem and then we saw what kind of tissues come from them and now we have learnt about the intercalary uh, meristem as well as lateral meristems okay. They respectively work in monocots and dicots. Alright, so now I am going to skip how the leaves form and how the vegetative growth happens and develops. Instead what we are going to do is we assume the plant has grown to the adult stage and now how the reproduction starts okay. So, uh, an important point to note here which I described or briefly mentioned at the very beginning as well in the previous class is that the plants do not make germ cells, they do not set up or the germ line during embryogenesis, okay. So instead the cells that can undergo meiosis, they are derived from the meristematic cells, the shoot uh, apical uh, meristem when it switches uh, from vegetative to reproductive um, uh, phase okay. And that again like how I was emphasizing on how environment matters for germination. So similarly here again the environment has to be sensed and appropriate environment required for optimum reproduction is essential okay. So, merely switching to making um, reproductive structures under harsh conditions you know in, in, uh, which is not conducive for uh, setting uh, you know the seed production is not going to be um, uh, uh, suitable for optimum reproductive capacity. So timing matters, timing of flower is crucial, is it going to flower in the deep winter or it is in the, going to do in the spring or is it going to do in the transition from summer to winter okay. So when flowering will be optimum for that given species. So that has to be sensed. So obviously uh, photoperiodism that is the light uh, duration you know is it a short day or long day sensing that is going to be crucial uh, in transitioning from vegetative to reproductive. So first of all I want to emphasize the point that there is a transition. So the during the vegetative growth the apical meristem keeps producing leaves, branches, leaves, branches, leaves, branches that is it okay. So that uh, fate of those meristem cells need to transition and now it should start making reproductive structures. For example, instead of producing leaves and stems it should now produce inflorescence. And the inflorescence in turn should start producing um, you know uh, flowers and that is what we call as the vegetative to reproductive transition. So such a transition exists okay and that is regulated by variety of environmental conditions and I have just alluded to the importance of the light okay. And second the number of seeds produced need to be balanced with the resources allocated per seed. So are you going to provide a seed lot more than the food reserve it needs then you will end up producing only fewer seeds and that may not be evolutionarily successful. Um, so therefore an optimum is determined okay. So this is the food reserve available with me as an adult plant entering into vegetative reproduction with this this is the maximum seed that can successfully you know go and germinate uh, can be produced. So that optimum needs to be 
uh, arrived at and these are all tightly genetically controlled um, by sensing the environment. Okay. So, and these environmental conditions vary, okay. it, not all angiosperms uh, sense the same environment and induce uh, reproduction, it varies. You know, some flower before winter like for, um, for example, apple uh, and other uh, berries and some of them flower uh, like for example, neem trees in India, they flower in the um, you know, spring right after the winter season um, just before summer. So, uh, it all depends on that particular species, how it developed adaptations to a given environment. So, the main point is environmental conditions sensed by different organs regulate flowering. Okay. So, the sensing is done by different organs like leaves uh, primarily and then uh, root as well as um, stem, all of them are important, but the primary sensing uh, is the leaves. Okay. Um, and in addition to sensing the environment, some plants need to grow in the vegetative uh, uh, fate for certain period of time and during that period of time even if the correct environmental conditions are there they are not going to switch into reproductive mode ok. So, this is called juvenile uh, phase and therefore, there is a juvenile vegetative growth to adult vegetative growth that phase change is required in some plants. Uh, this is not common in annuals meaning a plant that lives for less than one year. So, there this is not an important point, but some of them like you know a, a, a good example you may be familiar is the coconut trees that grow in many of our house gardens. Uh, they do not start uh, producing coconuts right after coming out of the ground within the first year you know. Uh, le let us say it is going to flower um, in the fall season, in the very first fall it is not going to start flowering. So, the same environment exists, but it does not start uh, producing flowers. So, it need to reach adulthood ok and that transition it has to undergo before it can actually respond to environment. So, therefore, it, its leaves and roots and other tissues probably lack competence to sense the environment. Okay. So, we have learned this induction competence concept in animal development earlier that applies here as well. So, this is an important concept we need to remember okay. juvenile to adult transition. And once that happens, then you have uh, another transition which is uh, vegetative. I, I just told you this like instead of producing leaves and stems, then it starts to make inflorescence. So, the apical meristem transitions into what is called floral meristem, uh, sorry, inflorescence meristem, ok. And that uh, vegetative meristem to inflorescence meristem transition is governed by uh, multiple things and in Arabidopsis I have four of them have been identified. One of them is sensing light, this is usually done via a, a group of molecules called phytochromes and they are important for that. And then there is a genetic pathway that works autonomously, so we will learn soon uh, about one of the genes that responds to both of them. And then vernalization I told you this is like the stratification we learnt in uh, germination. So, the plant should have experienced a period of uh, chillness you know the winter and that is required um, for some of them. So, all of them do not work in all of them, some work in some species, some do not work in uh, the same species, but work in another species. So, vernalization then a plant hormone gibberellin which is required for germination and the same uh, plant hormone is required to go from um, vegetative meristem fate to inflorescence meristem fate. And once the transition happens, then this inflorescence meristem need to produce uh, axillary meristems which are actually going to make the flowers. Okay. So, they are called the floral meristems and there are genes that specify them and uh, they are the hallmark of those cells and they are called the 
floral meristem identity genes. Okay. So, these are more like the homeotic, these are homeotic genes, but they are not the Hox genes we learnt in Drosophila. They belong to a different group of conserved, evolutionally conserved genes um, and they function as the homeotic genes here. Uh, we will see that in detail as we go along. And once the floral meristem is uh, set apart and these meristems now are capable of activating genes that are going to actually make the different floral parts or the floral organs like petals, sepals, carpel, stamen, um, all the those four structures. And these are called the floral organ identity genes. You know a given gene will be required to make um, the petals for example and, and its expression would be uh, characteristics of the petal and that is why you use the word identity here, floral organ identity gene. So, you have the vegetative meristem becoming inflorescence meristem. The difference here is the inflorescence meristem instead of producing leaves and stems, it is going to produce the floral meristems on the axis or, or axillary meristem. So, that is how the floral meristems form. And these floral meristems then activate the production of uh, floral organs by activating the floral organ identity genes. So, this is how the flower uh, eventually forms. Okay. So, here is the genetic pathway that has been understood so far. Um, so, the, the gene, the products of genes are uh, constants. Um, is required for sensing light and that in turn activates a gene called flowering locus T or shortly FT and this FT is transported. Um, we do not know exactly how it is transported, it mostly the mRNA is transported and to the, the shoot apex and that, and that is required for the activation of the transition from the vegetative to inflorescence meristem fate. And this FT interacts with the transcription factory FD and that induces the formation of the floral meristems on the side by activating the floral meristem uh, specifying genes. Um, the more the, the very well understood and important one is the leafy which acts like a master regulator of floral meristem fate. Uh, we will see that in a minute in uh, how the mutant phenotypes look and they then activate the floral organ identity genes. Okay. And another uh, gene that we need to talk about is the um, transition of the vegetative meristems to inflorescence meristem that is governed by the terminal flower 1. So, the terminal flower 1 inhibits um, the vegetative meristem converting into inflorescence meristem or producing the flower, one single flower at the terminus and that is inhibited by this. Okay. And that has to be overcome by this light induced and other, other factors induced, you know the four pathways we saw and that needs to be suppressed to transition into the inflorescence uh, meristem fate. Okay. So, once, um, so now how do we know this is how it all happens and uh, you know leaf is really required for floral meristem identity, you know floral meristem identity, how do we know all of that? These are all based on the mutant phenotypes like the uh, name tells you terminal flower 1 meaning if it is not there you are going to produce a flower at the terminus of the shoot. Okay. So, Similarly, if you do not have leafy, what happens? If you do not have apetala 1, you know the spelling is here apetala 1 or cauliflower, what is going to happen? So, these are the things um, that come from the phenotype of the mutants. So, they are shown here. So, this is Arabidopsis wild type flower. You have the nice, um, you know, petals and uh, sepals and, you know, stamen is visible there. And this is the leafy mutant you know it, uh, it does not produce um, all the required uh, genes to make proper floral meristem on the side on, on the axis. Okay. And here you have apetala 1 in its mutant you have 
um, you know, clearly the calyx and coral are missing, okay. So, the sepals and petals are not produced. And when you have both of them missing, it is like leaf after leaves, okay. So, the inflorescence meristem is incapable of producing floral meristems and as a result floral organs do not form. And in the uh, epital of wine and cauliflower mutants, so these two seem to function redundantly uh, such that cauliflower single mutants do not have any uh, noticeable uh, abnormality in the phenotype. But epital of one cauliflower together it continuously makes inflorescence meristem after inflorescence meristem and it never produces floral meristem. Instead in that place it makes only inflorescence meristem and that ends up making cauliflower like appearance and that is why it is called cauliflower. So, the summary here we have is photo period, uh, photo period and autonomous pathways activating floral meristem genes. So, this regulation is well understood for leafy gene. So, leafy promoter has two distinct regions, one response to the photo period and another one response to um, you know gibberellin. And once these floral meristem genes are activated, then they go on to activate uh, a set of genes called uh, region specifying genes. Well, a good example is Superman. And these region specifying genes, what they do actually is they define the boundary of expression of organ identity genes, okay. We will talk about organ identity genes in the next class and where each one of them will be expressed. What is the, the spatial range in which these organ identity genes will be expressed is defined by these region specifying genes. And now these organ identity genes activate the downstream genes required to produce a given floral organ. So, this is how the environmental uh, environmental signals and autonomous genetic signals are all sensed and uh, the vegetative apical meristem is converted into making floral organs. So, we will see how these organ identity genes function and what is our current uh, understanding of how they specify the different parts of the flower etcetera in the next class.